Sure, and I'll give you another big positive that uh, just to connect the dot. Maybe, just maybe, this is the start of, of the bottom for commercial real estate as well. Because Andy Bush actually joins us from Chicago. You there? Yeah, I'm here, Melissa. Hey, I feel like it's the Charlie's Angels. Andy's your mom. <laughs> It's interesting to put this in the context of the bank earnings because they've been so strong despite the backup of interest rates. So Fernandez should feel a lot more comfortable saying, you know what, higher interest rates are part of the game when we have an improving economy. I'm not that concerned that they're really going to hurt the banking sector or the consumer. Well, a little bit of fun with that. The next piece 
This is a 40-page paper that was presented at the 2010 uh, Kansas City Symposium in Jackson Hole. Um, now, we just finished that this past weekend, so that's kind of fresh in everybody's minds. It's about a 40-page paper. If you type it into Google and hit PDF, it'll pop right up for you. This looked at financial crises over the last about 100 years. And it's really kind of interesting, because then go through an average what stock markets have done, what real estate prices have done, how long crises have lasted um, after you pop the bubble. And basically, here's the kind of a, just the cheat notes on it. There's a 10-year, 30% increase of credit to GDP leading up to the bubble. Once the bubble pops, it's about a 10-year ramp down in the same amount. Okay, for real estate prices, more importantly for you gentlemen and ladies, is that in the seven years after a bubble pops, real estate prices drop 15 to 20 percent, and they do not recover to their previous levels. So if you think about it here, if you go back to 2006, that's the peak of real estate prices, add seven years on, and lo and behold, we are seeing almost exactly what they predicted back in 2010. Real estate has bought for sure, we know this. Real estate prices are going along, they're increasing year over year at about a 12% clip. That's pretty, that's pretty awesome. And, you know, I mean, we're 2006, 2013, so we've pretty much seen the bottoming of the, mar of the market. Now, it doesn't mean things are gonna get great right away, and it doesn't mean it's gonna recover, you know, super strong, but we know the worst is over. And that's really the best message I can tell you from going forward uh, from this point on. I mean, if 2016 is our 10-year period of deleveraging in the United States, and we're in 2013, hey, we got a little bit more to go, perhaps, but the worst of the worst is over, and that's the best news I can tell you. And finally, on this piece, this is a little bit uh, more controversial, but it talks about um, government's uh, uh, austerity plans. And since we're in an austerity kind of mojo right now, whether it's Europe, uh, even China to some extent, but certainly in the United States with the sequester or the cutting back of spending, it's important to understand that the mix matters, right? Spending cuts versus tax increases. It matters for the economy because tax increases are three times worse than spending cuts on their impact on the economy. So that's what we want to keep in mind when we're looking at plans to reduce the budget deficit, plans to reduce the debt. If you want to do it in a thoughtful process, and I know the word thoughtful in Congress, probably not in the same sentence too often, but if Congress was going to behave in a thoughtful process, it would be three to one, spending cuts and tax increases. So keep that in mind when we're going through some of this stuff. Um, next up, just to look at this, because we're in the past, you do have to be careful, because you never know when double GDPs start falling on your head, right? And this is exactly what happened. You can see what happened back in 2008, 2010. Things kind of cratered for the developed world, right? And they've planned out since then. Also for the emerging markets, you can see up there, same, same pattern. If you put these all together and take a look at where we are in the present, this is what you got. It looks kind of flatlining with a slightly upward slope. And if we look at the general consensus numbers for um, economic growth, and we crystal ball these things a little bit with, with the IMF, and they're, they're kind of the average way of looking at things for, for what they're expecting for the rest of the year. You know, you're looking at the United States for 2013 at about 1.7%. 2014, 2.7. And you can see this pattern for each kind of area, Europe, China, and for Japan. Okay. Sure get all those. This is one of the reasons why stock markets have gone up. Because and risk has been put on this year. Because it's forward looking. We're always forward looking. We're always trying to figure out what's happening not now, six months, 12 months down the road. And at the beginning of this year, things were looking pretty good for what this year could be. And that's what we saw. So the question is from here, right, we, we have to figure out what are the three key questions or the three major fates of the world, right? And to do that, we're going to turn to three very young women to get some assistance. Oh my god. Oh, you are so popular. Like a spoon. 
Clothio, Lapius, and Atropos. Now back in ancient Greece, men used to believe that their fates were tied to what these three young girls would tell them. And when I was studying, I used to think, you know, that's pretty ridiculous, right? How can a man think that you know young women have that influence on their happiness? <laughs> Until I had teenage daughters. Now I know better. They're very important. You know, it's right up there with happy life, happy wife, right? Same kind of concept. Um, but in this case, we're going to look and try to answer these three key questions, right? Can the U.S. government get out of the way? Can you know, what's next for Europe? And finally, can the Far East sustain? So to do this, I thought we'd start off in the United States because the, you know, this is where things are happening right here, and we'll take like a little bit of a musical interlude to talk about where President Obama is right now and, and how he looks at the world from his second term. <laughs> Equation down here. 
And you plug that in, and I looked at it, and honestly, I said to myself, there's only about a 53% chance that the Senate's going to turn over to the Republicans. Now, that is with really, I mean, if you look at the election, the uh, races that are, that are truly competitive, right? That's a, that is a term in political science. Competitive races, nine of the Democrats that are up for Senate re-election are in competitive places, com competitive races, and only two for the Republicans. But I still came up with 53% chance. So it's positive, it's a potential, but it's only that much. Now, here's the key for you guys. Try taking this framework and applying it to something that's in banking or in your own life. Right? The key is to assess like, what your prior probability is. Interest rates is a great way to start off with saying, do I really think interest rates are going up? Put a number on it. Right? Then be able to say, okay, something else has come up. Let's say tapering. What does that mean? You know, plug in the prior, you know, plug in the percentage of what you think it is, and then come up with a number. The whole concept of this thing is to get you to think more realistically and probabilistically about the events that are going on in your world instead of just reacting to them if they come up. This gives you a, a lot more um, intellectual firepower to object, address uh, the potential for bad things happening or good things happening. You can anticipate it. You can say, hey, it's a 53% chance. Oh, that's not that big of a deal. You plug in a few different numbers, and if all of a sudden it starts getting near 70, that's a different way of looking at the world, right? So that's what I want you to do. Just think about it, take it home, play around with it a little bit, and it's, and it's pretty fun to do. Now, having said that, one of the things that's in President Obama's advantage, or in his court, of course, is the FOMC, right? So we need to go to Magic 8 Ball to figure out what we're going to do. I don't know about you guys, but I had one of these things when I was growing up. Of course, we always threw it and broke it, and then this really weird stuff came out and kind of wrecked it, right? And it was always stuck on question mark. I don't know why. Um, but that's the way it is. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to shake the Magic 8 Ball, and we'll see what comes up. Because a lot of people don't understand, there's actually two components to Fed policy. One is zero interest rate policy. Now, this is, this is the interesting part of it, because they put interest rates at zero quite a ways back. But what's interesting is not that. What's interesting is what they told us about what they're going to do in the future. And that's kind of fun. They gave us the metrics by which they're going to change off of zero interest rates, didn't they? 6.5% unemployment and 2.5% inflation, right? That's interesting. Hold that thought for a second. We shake the magic eight ball one more time. And we get this, quantitative easing. Now, quantitative easing is basically the moonshine that the Federal Reserve is on right now. It is the crazy part of being a central banker. And the reason why I say that is because nobody's done what the Federal Reserve has done. They've taken their balance sheet from $800 billion to $3.65 trillion. And they're not sure if that was the right thing to do. <laughs> no, I'm not kidding. <laughs> Read some of the FOMC statements. They're like, you know, I'm not sure this is working anymore. Maybe we should try something else. Now, why don't we plug somebody else in to be the chairman? That's not a bad idea. Seriously, though, this is the conversation they're having. And it didn't start this year, right? It actually started in December of last year. We know this because when the minutes were released in January of the December uh, 2012 meeting, this is what scared everybody. Take a look at your interest rate charts. That's when we saw a spike up, back, back down, and then again, back in May, we had a big move up. Why? Why is this stuff going on? Well, um, part of it has to do with this, right? Shake the magic eight ball one more time, and indeed, we get tapering. Now, tapering, as we now have found out, could mean a lot of different things, right? It could mean that the Fed, in September, on September 18th, which is our next big meeting, they could announce, we're not going to you know, buy any more treasury securities or mortgage-backed securities. Or they could announce that we're thinking about not buying anymore, and we're data dependent until November or December. Or they could say, you know, we kind of like buying the mortgage-backed securities, so we're just going to slow down the treasury securities and the buying of those things. 
a lot of permutations here to work with. And it's kind of hard to figure out exactly what they're going to do, except that we know they're going to do something because they're talking about it a lot. Now, for me, what's fun being an independent research guy, and independent on my own, as of January 1st, and you can find my research at andrewbush.com, <laughs> that I get to convene different groups of people, right? And I, I've had a lot of contacts with the people in the hedge fund world, and so I thought, you know what, it would be a really good idea to convene a group of people into babies, have this conversation. So I said, why don't I get the sharpest, youngest minds who are trading out there, and let's sit down and ask this question, is more quantitative easing better, or is less quantitative easing better? And, so, and sometimes, you know, these things, the youngest people have the best ideas. And this one young lady, well, here, I, you know, I recorded it, so let's just roll the tape on it. And you can see what their answers are. Who thinks more is better than less? <laughs> <laughs> more is better than less, because if stuff is not working, if there's more less stuff, then you might, you might want to have some more, and your parents just don't want you because there's only a little. Right. We want more, we want more. Like, you really like it, we right. want more. I <laughs> <laughs> More is better. <laughs> well, there you have it. Pretty simple, right? More is better. Uh, and that's really where the markets fit, especially the equity markets. As soon as they start talking about tapering, everybody gets a little jittery. Oh, what does that mean? You know, it has ramifications globally, doesn't it? Where have we really seen the biggest pullback? It's not in the United States, it's in the emerging markets. When U.S. interest rates go up 100 basis points, 130 basis points, that means the rest of the world's yield curve goes up too, if they're gonna match it, and if they're gonna continue to attract capital. So the people that are getting whacked the most are in India. They're in uh, places like Australia, believe it or not. Um, also for Malaysia, the Indian rupee is now making successively lower lows for the U.S. dollars making higher highs. People are pulling billions of dollars out of emerging markets. This is part of what's going on with the Federal Reserve and their impact globally. So the Federal Reserve is going to go through a lot of dislocation and um, policy because they can't. They know that they have to be very careful about how they provide forward guidance, but also how they get out of tapering. And this, this is one of the biggest problems. Now, why are they talking about tapering? Well, this is why, because them, like me, they're optimistic about the future, maybe a little too much. But this isn't hard to figure out why people are optimistic in the United States. These three things tell you why, in, in a nutshell. I mean, we all know that, oops, one more. We all know that housing is stabilized. I kind of talked about it, but you can see it in the numbers. Even with new home sales down, they're down like 13%. Existing home sales were up significantly, so just be a little bit careful about some of the headline numbers. Rising energy tide. Um, I'm in Indiana, obviously, here and coming with Illinois, there's a massive shale deposit in southern Indiana and southern Illinois. Um, of course, I'm from the great state of Illinois, so we'll totally screw it up um, as far as getting the gas out. But this is the big story in the United States. Um, and how much trapped natural gas means for this country because it's reducing our energy costs. Natural gas is about four times cheaper than it here than it is just in Mexico. In Mexico, they pay like $15 a cubic foot. Here it's like $342 or whatever it is, $348. That's a huge advantage for manufacturers here in the United States. Now this has implications not only for manufacturing, but also for the changeover from coal to natural gas plants. Uh, it also will, you know, by going into natural gas, it reduce a lot of CO2, things like that. But it makes us a mecca for manufacturing because our costs are so much lower. Anybody who's using natural gas sees that, but it also shows up where? In electricity, in electrical prices. Our prices for electricity are about three to four times lower than what, are, than what they are in Europe, and, and certainly in the UK. If you're an aluminum producer, you better be looking at the United States because you use a ton of electricity when you create aluminum. So these are some big advantages for the United States. And again, as long as we don't screw it up, it'll be good. Now the best news I can tell you about screwing it up is that almost all of this has occurred on private lands, hasn't it? Not public. Thank God. <laughs> because it wouldn't have happened. And it came from private, well mainly private development. Maybe it got a little bit of a kickstart from the government. 
I'm not going to deny that, but I mean, it's really developed because it's all been on private lands. Marshallis, Bakken, uh, go down to Texas, lots of great things happening there. Car companies outside of this country are moving plants here, Tennessee, uh, uh, Michigan, believe it or not. Um, on, on the fertilizer side, big ammonia plants are, are popping up and they're using natural gas to get those things going for fertilizer. So those are positive things that are happening. Give us an advantage, create jobs, a lot of jobs going forward. So with that, why don't we compare, since the crisis, why don't we compare ourselves to the nations in Europe? Because it's a little hazy there. <laughs> since 2007, in other words, we're back above where we were in 2007, pre-crisis, and the rest of these nations are significantly below. And that's the problem for Europe. And when we're talking about Europe, here's the biggest issue, is when you don't grow, you get into a debt death spiral. And here's how this works. So you already have a high amount of debt in Europe, right? They spent a lot more than they were taking in. And all of a sudden, you stop growing, so then your tax receipts start to go down. So all of a sudden, that debt and deficit to GDP start to expand out. And when they get really big, then the market takes notice, and they stop buying your bonds because, hey, they want to get compensated for that risk they're taking. We don't know if you're going to be able to make payment on your bonds. And that cycle just gets going, and it gets going, and it gets going. And that's what we saw with Greece, right? And that's what we saw with Spain and Italy. So much so, that, I don't know if you can remember, back to last summer, things were in a bad state. Oops. <laughs> and what happened was, the European Central Bank did something similar to what the U.S. Central Bank did. They didn't buy assets, but they came up with these three key programs. And for you guys, um, these acronyms should mean something, but perhaps they don't, but they cover a lot of things that we talked about back in 2007. Long-term refinancing operations this is from the European Central Bank. This was for counterparty risk between banks. It provided a three-year lending window. European stability mechanism. This is this 500 billion euro bailout facility that provided comfort to the markets that Italy and Spain could be bailed out if they asked for assistance. And finally, um, Mario Draghi, who's the head of the European Central Bank, created something that was so powerful, it's never been used outright monetary transactions. That's where the central bank has the authority to step in and buy sovereign debt of another nation. After this, and Draghi's pledge to do whatever it takes to keep the euro safe, 10-year Spanish bond yields dropped from 7% down to about 4%. Now that's massive. It really makes funding yourself a hell of a lot easier if your rates drop in half, right? That's pretty good. Now, Draghi's taken on this kind of mythical persona within Europe and somewhat outside of Europe, so that all of his press conferences are, are so focused on, and they, they're now uh, really looked at it very similar to the United States of what they're going to do to help their countries. And the European Central Bank has adopted some of the policies of the U.S. Federal Reserve in giving forward guidance. As a matter of fact, it's now when he holds a press conference after a rate decision, it kind of turns into a circus. It's Mario Draghi. He is the swami of Europe. If I'm the wizard of finance, he's the swami of Europe. So he's, he's got kind of a archaic, a little arcane with his comments about interest rates and when they're going to change. And he says, it's not six months. Oh no. And it's not 12 months. You flip a more card. It is, indeed, an extended period of time. <laughs> And that's all he said. Now that should ring, right? Because the Fed says the same thing, extended period of time, extended period of time. So this is kind of the game that they play. So we move from the circus to kind of a clown car here. Um, let's switch over and talk about a country that's got some issues. Now, China, obviously, is the other big, one of the big stories, too. And they're facing a lot of problems, right? They're, they're going through a lot of shifts. They're going through a leadership shift. They're going through a growth shift as they move. You know, well, let me talk about the leadership shift just a little bit. They've gone from, you know, from, um, 
uh, to Xi Jinping from Hu Jintao, right? So Xi Jinping has taken over for the next 10 years. And he's trying to manage this growth shift downward from double-digit growth rates down to 7.5%. And to do that, he's also deleveraging their economy a little bit. That's why there's been some you know, dislocations within the Chinese lending markets, and there's been some problems there. Uh, so the world's gotten a little uncomfortable with what's happening there. And then finally, there's going to be this massive population shift. So if you think about um, Xi Jinping taking over, he's got all these issues. He's got that. He's got decisions to make about whether or not to go along with the United States on Syria. He's got cybersecurity issues. And he's got foreign policy issues. And of course, he is this guy. <laughs> Now, um, it, it, you know, some of the uh, things that came out of WikiLeaks uh, were the cables that were released by uh, U.S. ambassador in North Korea. And what they discovered was why Kim Jong-un was so upset with South Korea is because he believed that Tsai actually stole his hands from us. <laughs> Seriously, though, one of the craziest things that the Chinese are trying to do, and I mean crazy, is this. They are trying to migrate 250 million people over the next 10 to 12 years. And the New York Times did a great video on this. I just want to run it real quick uh, and just listen to what they're trying to accomplish. The Chinese government plans to move 250 million people from farms to cities. It plans to do this over the next 12 to 15 years. We're passing over some of the world's largest urban areas, and if we combine the population of all of these cities, we'll reach 250 million people, eventually. The scale of China's project is staggering. If it works, millions of farmers will move from their homes into newly built apartment blocks. Critics of the plan have called it warehousing. These major American cities represent only a fraction of China's goal. We get closer to the total if we add some of Europe's largest urban areas. If the Chinese government reaches its goal, 70% of its people will live in cities. The same transition took centuries in Western countries. At 85 million, we approach the number of Chinese villagers who have moved to cities since 2008. That past migration happened naturally. Farmers found jobs in cities and moved. It was part of a transition that had been underway for decades. China's current plan is far more deliberate and will happen faster. Farmers will now be forced to relocate. Even with some of Western Europe's major cities behind us, we're not even halfway there. We'll need to add many of the largest urban areas in the world. The government is hoping the farmers become urban consumers. Villagers typically grow their own food and provide their own energy. If the farmers find work in these new cities, they will buy electricity and use public transportation, purchase televisions and washing machines, and stoke the Chinese economy. <coughs> We're almost there now. Just add the population of Tokyo, the world's largest urban area, and we've made it. 250 million people. That is astonishing. Now, every time I hear somebody talk about how China's got these problems and they're not going to be able to handle it and things are going to slow down there, if they accomplish this, I mean, this is going to have wonderful opportunities for everybody in this country, especially from this area of the country, because they're going to need all sorts of food. They move that many farmers off their lands. Now, they'll get more efficient at it, but here's the problem with China, as everybody probably in this room knows. They're trying to feed 20% of the world's population and 10% of the world's arable land. The problem is, and they got a really big problem, is massive pollution. And it's heavy metal pollution. There are estimates that they've lost 8 to 20% of their 10% of arable land due to pollution. 
As a matter of fact, they were supposed to release a study this year uh, done, done by the Chinese government talking about the extent of pollution in China. They did not release it because they said it was a state secret, meaning it's a lot worse than we thought. And that's really what's disconcerting. So China needs to you know, move a lot of people. They hope that that helps create in their society and move towards what we do in this country, which is our GDP is generated 70% by consumer spending. Currently in China, it's only about 45%. And they have modest goals to make it 47% by 2015. But they want it to be more like us because it creates a more stable economy. You're not as dependent um, on foreign and uh, FDI flow into the country uh, and on infrastructure projects. Uh, they have way too much investment-led uh, an investment-led economy, and, and that creates a lot of problems. So they'll still do their infrastructure, but they're going to try to get the consumer to spend more. And to do that, right, you also have to do a number of other things as a government. You have to provide a social safety net for people so that they feel comfortable spending their money. And you also have to give them higher uh, consumer spending through higher wages. And that's exactly what the Chinese government plan is. Their plan is to increase wages 13% per year for the next 10 years. That is also a really good thing for this country. Because not only can we sell in products, but all of a sudden, we start to get a lot more competitive on the wage front. If that's what they're doing, and they're raising their wages that significantly, and we keep our wages kind of in control, and guess what the other inputs, like energy, are lower here than they are in China, all of a sudden, our manufacturing starts to look a lot better. So those are some interesting things. Now, some people say this is a complete fantasy, that China can move that many people, uh, 250 million. It's an interesting goal. So why don't we move from fantasy into a little bit of fantasia and take a look at what's happening in Japan, because this is also significant. I don't know if you saw Mickey in Fantasia. It was one of my favorite shows growing up. Uh, this music is from the part where Mickey's the magician's assistant and he's making the room to carry the water and makes a complete mess of it. And I thought that was kind of appropriate for looking at Japan. And the reason why I say that is because what's happened is pretty extraordinary. Um, Abe took over back in December. Now, what's interesting about Japan, and you're probably wondering, how did their stock market go up 75% from last November and then back off 25%? in this year, right? It really had, I mean, that's a roller coaster. 75% in less than nine months, that's pretty crazy. Well, here's what happened. Abe took over, but before he ran for president, he said, this is my plan. I want to reflate the Chinese, or the Japanese economy. I want, to make, I want to make the yen weak, and I want to make stocks go up, and we want to hit inflation. We want to get inflation up around 2%, and it's currently below 1%. How do we do that? Well, big stimulus spending program. Right? We also need the Bank of Japan to be aggressive on quantitative easing. That's the little guy at the bottom, Kuroda. Now here's what's fun about Kuroda. He wasn't at the head of the Bank of Japan back in, in November. No, he wasn't. He was coming in in April. He was going to be appointed by Abe. But the markets didn't wait for that. No, they started buying right away. Because they felt that whoever Abe was going to put in there was going to follow through on the plan. Right, so this is this is the equivalent. Right, so think back to college. Not the third journey. Think back to college, right? And just kind of work with me on this. And you meet this wonderful girl, and she's spectacular. She's beautiful. She's smart, intelligent. She actually laughs at your jokes. Doesn't think you're a slob, right? This is great. So you ask her out, and she says, "Yes, I'll go out with you, but not now. In four months." So in four months, you anticipate this event occurring. And you're thinking, this is going to be great. Actually, you should cut my hair, shave, you know, start wearing nicer clothes, maybe lose a few pounds before this event occurs. All of a sudden, the day comes around, you have your date, and it's fantastic. Not only is she smart, funny, gets your jokes, tolerates you, but you find out that um, she is, uh, drinks beer with shots and is in three fantasy football leagues. In other words, your expectations were not only met, they were exceeded. And that's exactly what happened when this guy, Kuroda, came in. He engaged in quantitative easing. The markets were anticipating that, but he blew it out. He really bought a lot more than what the markets were anticipating. Now, Japan quantitative easing is a little bit different from the rest of the world. They actually buy not only government securities or JGBs, they buy REITs. They buy 
um, ETFs on the Nika. They actually own part of companies. I mean, we would never allow our central bank to do that, would we? Would we? No, we wouldn't. It's terrible. But I mean, it shot up the stock market, right? Now, so Avi's got this program, right? That was two of the arrows, right? So if we want to look at it, let's take a look at what he did, right? So first arrow was stimulus spending, 10.3 trillion uh, yen worth of government spending. They did that. Next one, Bank of Japan, yes, got that bingo, right? And then all of a sudden, the last one, you know, kind of missed economic reform. Now, he was supposedly waiting for the summer to get the parliamentary elections, blah, blah, blah. Let's face it, folks. The hard place between the rock and the hard place, that spot, the hardest thing to do is to get political momentum to make economic reform. It's where Europe's at, right, as far as Greece goes and some of these other countries. It's where the United States is at right now. We don't have forward momentum on things that are really important, like tax reform. It's not there. And in Japan, it's almost the exact same thing. They need to change their labor markets and change the lifetime employment rule. They need to reduce tariffs on agricultural products, like the 500% tariff on rice. They need to change a lot of things on the medical field, believe it or not, as well. So they got a lot of things that they need to change to get economic growth going. And that's gonna, you know, that political power, that political capability is lacking, not only in Japan, but it's a consistent theme across the world. And that's something to keep in mind when we're looking into the future. So with that, let's look at the back half of this year, what we got left. Here's what I think. Um, as far as the US goes, we're gonna see growth accelerate. Let me just say why, really quickly. Second and third quarters, the biggest quarters for fiscal drag in the country, the equivalent of about 2% on the redu reduction in government spending. After that, it's only 0.9% as far as taken away from GDP for the fourth quarter. If we keep coupling along, you know, and with the private sector grows at 4%, or 2.5% or 3.5%, then we're going to get a net of about 2.5% or maybe even higher for the fourth quarter. And already, this quarter, we're going to see, and the second quarter is going to be 2.2%, and that's with 2% fiscal drag. In other words, the private sector's clipped along pretty good. So I like that. Again, it's another reason why I'm optimistic about the future, but also why rates have moved up. As far as Europe goes, they're going to grow at about a half a percent. So they're exiting their recession that they were in for the last five quarters, and their unemployment rate is going to start to drop. That's a good thing. China, they're going to grow a target, but they're going to have problems with this deleveraging process as they're trying to squeeze out some of the crazy lending that have been going on. And finally, for Japan, their two arrows will work, but it doesn't really end deflation, which is what they really need to get. So from the end of 2013 into 2014, here's what I think. Um, I'm a little bit out there on this one, but I think you'll see where I'm going on it. I'm a little more optimistic. I think we're going to see 3% GDP growth at some point in 2014, and I think you will get 4% on the 10-year. Now, stocks are relatively outperformed, but not, you know, I mean, everything's compared to something else. So I don't think they're necessarily going to rock and roll. Uh, certainly, we've already seen about, we're, we're getting to my point where I thought we would pull back from the peak at the S&P over 1,700, I was looking for at least a 5% pullback. That's somewhat happening. We're almost to it today. Um, but this is something going forward. I don't think we're going to see a lot of forward momentum here unless we get things like tax reform going in this country. Um, as far as Europe goes, they have weak European growth. And as I kind of pointed out, that cycle is still there. The European Central Bank is reluctant to do what the Federal Reserve Bank has done here and what the Bank of Japan is doing. Because because they don't want to have, they don't want to take the place of the hard decisions that have to get made. And hard decisions get made when bad things are happening, don't they? If the Federal Reserve hadn't stepped in, I guarantee you we would have had tax reform by now. We would have restructured some things. We would have reduced some of the regulations that are hitting businesses that hurt economic growth. But because we've grown a bit, and we're going to continue to grow a bit, we may not get what we really need in the long run. And that's the same for Europe. China, 7.5% growth. They've got some debt issues. They've got pollution problems that I talked about really quickly. But they're going for consumer spending. That's really where they want to go. And for this urbanization, I think that's pretty clear. And finally, with Japan, um, they're going to grow. But I, I really think they're going to struggle getting 
the next part, right, which is the economic reform that they need to do. Now, with those predictions, there indeed come risks. There it is. The scary part of the program! Holy cow! What? You may be wrong, Andy. I remember back in 1982, I was wrong once, and then, no, seriously, <laughs> It's not, it's not about being wrong, right? It's about trying to figure out you know, what can come up and, and bite you. And to me, it's not one thing. It's really the combination of things that could hit at the same time. And it's through those combination of things, that's what I get worried about. I, I guess the best example, the best way of looking at this is, you know, I kind of searched around and I thought this was really representative of, of, com of combining things that would really make something bad. Um, in, in 2014 at some point, 
They probably won't stay there really long, uh, just as we got close to 3% just a couple weeks ago, and now we've backed down to 2.75 on the 10 year. That's what I think we'll do. So it's still a volatile environment, but one in which your financial wizard has led you through. Thank you very much.